this kind of diff if you compare what's going with Edward Snowden and Alexei Navalny, I mean, do you think there's some kind of paradox going on there, some kind of double standard? Uh, yes, I think it's a very different situation, the boys. And I think, uh, well, Snowden... Um, I think Navalny is fighting for the freedom uh, uh, or the political freedom in Russia, whereas uh, with Edward Snowden, is, uh, it's obviously a very uh, different and a difficult case. He's stuck in the airport, but is he really? Where is he? And who's, uh, who's interested in him being in Moscow? Let's move on to the next one. All right, well, just one more um, item to show you, Laura. As, we, as you said at the beginning, um, Alexei Navalny, he does a lot of his work online, doesn't he? That's, That's why he's right. best known, as Doug pointed out, on the internet. That's right, blogs and, uh, you know, a very big social media presence. Uh, Change.org, which is um, a petition website around the world, there is a French-language petition, no to the political, um, I suppose, sentencing and the in unfair trial against the Russian opponent, Alexei Navalny. And that has collected, I think, some 18,000 signatures already. Mm. Uh, so certainly people mobilizing online to express their opposition to what has happened. Mobilizing online and on the streets. Yes. All right, James Creedon. Thank you right. very much, as always. I'm going to come back over here. Um, I wonder if we can bring in uh, our guest in Moscow now. Alexei Malashenko uh, is there. I don't know if you've been listening in, but there's been some pretty heated debates over whether or not this was a political trial or not. Oh, we seem to have lost uh, Alexei Malashenko. All right, let's move on to something else. Um, Nina, let me ask you a bit about where the opposition movement goes from here, because, uh, you know, Navalny wasn't just a, a blogger, was he? He wasn't just a campaigner. He was also seen as the only uh, credible opposition leader by many of people who oppose Putin. Uh, what will you do now? Is there anyone else to step into his shoes in the, in the time he's in jail? Uh, I think it's important, like Navalny said himself, it's important for the people to mobilise around... Um, around the cause, because it's not about Navalny or it's not about the Putin, it's about the regime. It's not a personal fight between uh, the two people. It's about the regime, the corruption, what, what he was fighting. So I think uh, we should just carry on the fight. And, and no, and it is interesting, uh, just to reinforce that point, um, in his tweets, Navalny has made it very clear uh, this is not, he doesn't want to personalize this. I mean, sure, okay, he has an ego. He likes power like, you know, a lot of politicians do. I'm sure he'd love to be president someday. But that says he does seem to have um, a conviction that the opposition does not live or die on his presence center stage on the political scene. He is now cognizant of the fact that for better or for worse, he's going to be sidelined for the next several years, enough to probably, well, to knock him out of the mayoral race almost definitely and probably out of the next presidential race in 2018. And so his message basically to that opposition is, like we said in the beginning, don't just sit there. He says, literally, he he, uh, he, he tweeted lazy, today, don't be, don't be bored without don't me. Bored. You know, don't, don't miss me too much. You guys, you have all it takes to do it yourself. And I mean, I'm sure John Laughlin is, is a big fan of this, but a lot of the Western media today has been uh, referring to Navalny as the, the Russian Nelson Mandela. I mean, is there a risk now for the Kremlin that he will become some kind of martyr figure and he will just simply uh, rally the opposition even more? I'm sorry, you say even more. You referred to him in your introduction just now after the break as opposition leader. He's not an opposition leader. He doesn't lead anything. He doesn't well, lead he led the biggest the protest against Putin opinion. in 10 yeah, years. Yeah, but he's not a leader. You are on the wrong planet. The leader of the opposition in Russia is the Communist Party. That is the largest opposition. And until you get your head around that, you won't understand anything about Russia. One of the many weaknesses of the Russian political system at the moment, and this is part of the key of the success of United Russia, Putin, Medvedev and so on, is precisely that the opposition has remained effectively unchanged now for 15 or 20 years. And I'm very pleased to see that new figures like Navalny and so on are coming on the, coming on the scene. That's a good thing. That's what we all want to see in a multi-party system. But the fact is he doesn't make the grade with the voters. Uh, and, you know... As I say, uh, the, the, the opposition uh, uh, scene, the political scene, will not really matter one way or the other whether or not he is around because he simply doesn't have the public Do support. And that's why we're essentially wasting our time talking about him. We should be talking about something real and not something that is invented by the Western so, media. Uh, Western media, perhaps. But what about Western governments? I mean, what about the United States saying they're deeply disappointed with this decision or the EU questioning the rule of law in Russia? I mean, is this all nonsense as well? Are they on the wrong planet too? Absolutely. I mean, we're... Yeah, if you're asking me if what Catherine Ashton says is nonsense, my answer is yes to whatever it is she says. Uh, but yes, I agree, it is nonsense. These people are all singing from the same hymn sheet. They have a, a single foreign policy on Russia. Uh, they have a single policy, by the way, also on Edward Snowden, whom you wanted to throw into the debate earlier. We saw that the European Union 
and the United States uh, are in marching in lockstep on, on Edward Snowden, and they are on Russia as well. So it doesn't. Uh, I don't. I don't take what they say with any seriousness at all. Okay, I want to go back. Sorry, Nini. Uh, yes, I just want to say one thing. I think uh, today might be the very, very important day for Russia because, first of all, it, it demonstrated the abolishment of the state of law in Russia, and I think uh, it might actually cause the opposite effect. I think. Now, without Navalny, people will, will show that they can go without him and there will be more and more people because they shouldn't be scared anymore. They should just go go there and, and speak for themselves. All right, let's talk about something in concrete terms now. Um, I think we can have a look at what happened to uh, the Russian stock index uh, when that uh, sentence was handed down to Alexei Navalny today. Can we bring that graphic up to see what happened earlier today? It should be coming on your screen soon. Basically, there was a huge drop uh, on the main Russian uh, index today uh, when that sentence was handed down. And Douglas, I want to take you back. There we go. As you can see, it plunged no, yeah, uh, you know, just well, that, before two o'clock. That's just tied to, that's pure uncertainty. You know, we, we talk a lot about Russia and, and especially with respect to investment climate, the business climate and the uncertainty of doing business there. And we talked about, you were talking earlier about the rule of law and it's all tied into that. It's this sense that here today, gone tomorrow, you can go in, you don't quite know that what you're doing is going to be underpinned legally and that contracts will be respected uh, and, and that your business will actually be there the next day. I mean, you know, we've, we've seen what happened to Bill Browder. Right, uh, well, I was going to say, you spoke to him this week. He was we, we, really uh, didn't mince his words at all, didn't he? He said he did, Russia he said, is a criminal regime. And we saw James showed us that tweet earlier, uh, 1937 all over again. What's 1937? Those were the height of the Stalinist show trials, uh, namely against Buharin, who was a Trotskyist in his circle. Buharin had been a key Stalin ally. Now, obviously, no, I am not going to be one of these people that compares Putin to Stalin. I think there are measures of exaggeration, and I'm not saying that at, by any stretch of the imagination. But I can, you can understand the parallels people make because the tr this type of case, it does have echoes of those types of show trials when you have so many witnesses who are not allowed to take the stand, when you have so, mu so much evidence which by the record has seemingly been fabricated in many cases. And, and the question I was going to put to John on the trial, and I respect the fact, John, you said you didn't follow the trial. Um, I didn't follow it in all its detail either. But if you're going to arrest uh, a, a Navalny and charge him on these charges uh, for uh, embezzlement of funds at a, at, at a timber company, why don't you just go straight down the list of uh, state-owned Russian companies starting at the top? Let's start at Gazprom, the oil and gas giant, and start going down that list. Look at their own financial transaction statements. You could argue the chairman and the leaders of those companies should be arrested on the exact same charges. We could line them all up. Take 100, 150 of the same trials. Start them tomorrow. Well, you have to also answer the question I put earlier, which is uh, why did one of the three defendants plead guilty and why is the third defendant a supporter of Putin? You haven't answered that question. As far as comparing it with other uh, potential indictees goes, again, uh, you know, let's talk about, if you want to compare things, let's compare things. Let's compare the uh, rulings against Berlusconi and Sarkozy. Let's discuss the imprisonment of Nicolas Bernard Bousse, a young man who was arrested quite uh, illegally in Paris and sentenced to two months in prison. Luckily, he's been released on appeal, but he was given a two months uh, prison sentence uh, in Paris on totally spurious charges and convicted of rebellion. Let's throw all these things into the pot. I don't mind. But let's get away from this infantile idea that Putin is clinging on to power only by force and by fear. And that, I'm afraid, is what you're saying. And you have made a comparison with Stalin by talking about 1937. And I'm afraid I, was I think you are out of your tree when you citting start a... making those kinds of comparisons. John, John, you're putting words in my mouth, we're please. Off, I was citing a tweet. No, tree. I'm not. That's uh, what you just said. Rachel you Denver. compared it to 1937. I did not. If Douglas. you listen to what I'm saying, I said I was yes, quoting did. a tweet from Bill Browder that was, was, that was cited in our press can review we, a few minutes ago. Can we bring in Rachel Denver? And then you went on to say it was like the Bukharin trial. No, I said I am by no stretch of the imagination, John, did I say I am making a comparison by Putin and Stalin? You could play back the tape after the show. Gentlemen, let's have a listen to Rachel Demers. She's at Human Rights Watch. Rachel, you wanted to come in on that point. Hey, I just want to come in on the point about why it was that someone uh, pled guilty. Um, uh, look, you know, I think you can probably imagine the kind of pressure that often happens behind the scenes in cases like this, where you have, you have three defendants, one of them has, and there's incredible pressure put on them. One of them pleads guilty and is promised a lighter and is promised a lighter sentence and has a lot of thinking to do, and turns evidence and well, turns evidence or produces um, 
produces incriminating sentences against the others, uh, uh, produces incriminating information against the others. It's a, it's a pretty common tactic in Russia and in other places. It's, it's very possible it's what happened in this case. I would also note, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned, John, that, um, that Afitserov, uh, Navalny's uh, co-defendant, is a Putin supporter. That's right. And he refused to turn evidence against Navalny. And that makes him kind of, uh, you know, some a pretty tragic collateral of this, uh, you know, of, of this uh, politically motivated case. I would. I think. I, I. I think it's wrong and not a very good exercise to get into big comparisons between Stalin and Putin, and and or even to to to, to cast this as a Putin versus Navalny and who is afraid of whom. What? Well, let's get back to the facts. The facts is that the facts are that there has been a crackdown, the worst crackdown that I have ever seen in my 21 years of monitoring and living in monitoring human rights in Russia. Much much of that time living and working in Russia. It's it's undisputed. It's a clear uh, across the board on a whole range of civil and political rights. You can't, I mean, you, you can't look at the situation and not make that conclusion. John, I want to address you directly on the issue of the foreign agents law because it's a, I am very familiar with the American law. And I would like to say that the American law does not equate the receipt of any, of any kind of um, foreign monies with being an agent of foreign interests. The foreign agents law says that you have to you to be a foreign agent. You are directly representing the interests of your sponsor. That is not what the Russian law says at all. And the groups that are affected work on a, a wide, wide range of issues, ranging from disability rights to environmental issues to fighting, combating torture. There are all kinds of advocacy organizations whose work has been very broadly defined as political by the prosecutors who are interpreting the law. So let's get our facts right. John Laughlin. Well, I'm sorry, that isn't, that's not a matter of facts. The American law does precisely identify as foreign agents uh, any organization which is in receipt of foreign government funding. Uh, and the, uh, I, and the, the, the main point is that this is merely a fiscal definition. It is not a fiscal definition, because I would also add that when you also made the point, uh, I think uh, you also made the point that um, the people that it's uh, perfectly okay to reveal, you know, you know, or needed to, to for organizations to reveal their funding. True, and that is what every organization in Russia that gets foreign funding has had to do for years now. They none of them hides the fact that they get foreign funding. They report to the Ministry of Justice. They report to the taxation authorities about their funding, including their foreign funding. What this law wanted to do was to put a stamp on all of these organizations that do all kinds of advocacy work, a stamp on, you know, they, like on their forehead, foreign agent, so that all of their, their website would be stamped with foreign agent, their materials, their speeches. And that can only have the purpose of trying to, 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 to stir up old, let's, mm. let's face it, in Russian, in a strani, it again, ha only has one meaning, and that is a spy or a traitor. Mm. It's a, it's, you know, you live in Russia, you know these things. So if you have a, an organization that has to put on its website, ya in a strani agent, it is unambiguous. And, and it evokes the old time. I mean, let you know, let's draw that parallel with the old Soviet times. You were an enemy of the people. You were a vrag naroda. You were, and that is, I'm sorry, that is the clear parallel here. And that is what people who are inclined, not everyone, of course, and not all Russians by any stretch of the imagination, but those are, who are inclined to have those xenophobic attitudes, to be anti-Western. Uh, Putin whips that up. He abets it. And, uh, and he's, he's wetting that, that already, that propensity uh, among a certain part of the Russian population to, yeah, to have these, these very anti-Western attitudes, anti-U.S., almost knee-jerk attitudes that have no real basis in fact or, or uh, that have no justification. I would put it a little bit differently. Um, I would say that uh, the, 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 the crackdown that's been underway for, for many, you know, for 13 or 14 months now, I think is intended, uh, I mean, I think it's tended to establish firmer control over civil society, firmer control over political life. This is, and this is the context in which we need to see the, 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 the sentence against Navalny. And it's also, I think, um, if you look at the way it's been taking place through, through the adoption of these laws in record speed through the Duma, um, I think that there. I think that they, you know, they these laws and you know appeal to, um, and I think are intended to appeal to the very conservative, you know, a conservative um, base that's a conservative constituency that I think is very supportive of the Kremlin. But again, very again, it goes. Well, it goes back to the economy to a certain extent, doesn't it, Rachel? Because, uh, you know, people say that Putin made a deal really with people when he took over in the shambolic uh, times post-Soviet uh, post Union. He, he, his gamble was, I'm going to restore credibility and uh, stability to the economy in return. 
you won't have as much political freedom. I mean, that payoff isn't going to work forever if foreign investors start pulling out of the country in droves uh, and we see the kind of uh, volatility that we've seen on the, on the stock market of late. Right. It's, I mean, it's hard to assert the, you know, the, the economic aspect here, but I think that it's very, I think it's pretty clear that these laws, that, you know, in and of themselves, have a populist um, have a populist component. I mean, the fact that they're adopted one after another with with almost no um, with with very little with very little debate with almost no opposition. Um, the the law against uh, homosexual or non traditional sexual uh, sexual propaganda had no it had you know no votes against it. I think it's intended to that the laws themselves serve as a um, uh, you know have have a kind of a propaganda aspect. In other words, you know, you know they because they're being um, adopted. Rachel, reason. sorry to interrupt you, but I just want to draw attention to what we're looking at on our screens. These are live pictures coming to us uh, from <laughs> Moscow now. There you can see, see uh, protesters <laughs> have turned out in large groups and there are some scuffles going on uh, mm -hmm. with, with the police there, uh, riot police, in fact, um, and crowds. Uh, we're told that around several thousand people have turned out to protest tonight in Moscow, in St. Petersburg and uh, elsewhere. Uh, Nina Zakharina Berezna, do you think we're going to see more of this over the next few days? Do you think uh, that... Um, opponents of Vladimir Putin will be able to rally the kind of crowds we saw at the end of 2011? I, I really hope so, because I think, as I said before, this is unauthorized protest at the moment. So I think if people were willing to go after what happened at Balotnaya uh, a year ago, if they were willing to go to this protest, I really hope that there will be authorized protests. And to be honest, I hope that people will just stay there and stay and they won't be scared anymore because I think by putting Navalny away, there will be more Navalny uh, appearing in Russia. There will be more bloggers. People will come out and speak out. Uh, Navalny has given this regime two years. He says that they will probably jail me and then we will bring down this regime within two years. Wishful thinking on his part, do you think? Or do you think... Uh, or or self-fulfilling prophecy, right. who knows? I mean, look, we, we've talked about Navalny. He, is, he doesn't hold... He pulls no punches in, in his language. He, the, like you said, you know, he's the one who coined the phrase the cooks, the, 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 the crooks and thieves, the swindlers and thieves. Uh, he's called them um, uh, monsters, basically. Uh, the, you know, lawless monsters, this regime, or bastards. Um, I think he does have a conviction that there's a sense of borrowed time with Putin's regime. And, and one of the things, you know, we've, we've read the blogs about is, and we were talking about the economic aspect, is a lot of Putin's um, ability to ride this wave of popularity in Russia has been predicated on the high oil prices. And the fact that until now he's been blessed, uh, at least during the first part of his presidencies, with, with a very strong oil economy. Um, that is not, if that is not the case in the future and oil prices do start to come down as they have been, um, plus you have the big gas and oil giant, Gazprom, which is now starting to, to, to falter a little bit, not just a little bit, its production is down, it desperately needs Western investment, and there's some upstart companies that are really uh, starting to come and breathe down its back. Uh, he can't rely on these stalwarts, these backbones of the Russian economy as much anymore. They're still very much a big presence. This could be a deciding factor. The combination, and, and no one, it, it, it's, it's unpredictable when and if the confluence of events, but the combination of foundering oil production, lowered oil prices, and econ capital outflows that continue last year to the tune of $57 billion, a very large black economy based on bribes to the tune of maybe $300 billion, by some estimates, almost 15% of the Russian economy, plus this Russian opposition, if it were able to coalesce again and rise beyond, what John has rightfully said is still a very, it's a very small minority of the population of this right. at this point. All of those factors, if and when they were to come together, mm -hmm. I think that would pose a potent threat to Putin. And I think that's what Alexei you, Navalny's you thinking that, about. You say that, though, but I mean... I mean, what, what counts for, for, for economic success is being able to trade with the rest of the world. Now, we, again and again, we hear uh, condemnation from the EU and from the United States uh, uh, and all the rest of it, um, but we never actually see any kind of real action in terms of, of the economy. Uh, maybe aside from the Magnitsky law in the United States, we don't really see any uh, definite action uh, from the rest of the world. Uh, John Laughlin, you were shaking your head throughout that, as you have been throughout most of this programme. What would you like to say? <laughs> Well, thanks very much. Yes, I was interrupted twice by both the other American speakers. I'm very sorry I didn't uh, get their names. I arrived late and... Uh, uh, Rachel so Denver and Douglas Herbert. Your nationality. Yeah, I'm very sorry. Forgive me. But uh, I, I'm afraid the truth popped out there, didn't it, just now? This is uh, this idea that Putin... Uh, is agitating uh, populist, anti-Western and, uh, uh, you know, oh horror, uh, xenophobic sentiment. You people are out of your tree. 
you ought to realize the extent to which world opinion regards the United States of America as one of the most systematic abusers of human rights. And if you think that you have any moral authority at all to speak to anybody on these issues, let alone to Russia, then I think you need a reality check. I can speak. Agreed, John. Agreed. But we're speaking about Russia now. Agreed. To stir up Agreed. Uh, a, opinion against, uh, um, uh, against America is I've been to the same two wrongs rubbish. don't make a right. He has never done that and he wouldn't need to do it anyway because most of the world is quite lucid about the reality of American foreign policy and indeed inter interior policy. Uh, John, would you like to argue with me on this issue? I am Russian. Yes, I'm very happy to... I'm very happy to... I've forgotten the po which particular point I wanted to bring up with you. There were so many different things. Well, uh, speaking about this anti-gay propaganda law, for example, I am Russian... Yes, I'm very happy to talk about that. Uh, the anti-gay propaganda thing is, a ref is, is against uh, um, publicising and promoting homosexuality to children, in front of children. Why did you not mention that when you talked about it? It is a law designed to protect children from homosexual uh, propaganda. So now if you're a couple... The exact same law... The exact same law was passed by the British government in 1988. And how exactly this do you imagine some... uh, well, doing later propaganda uh, again, in front I'm of being children? Interrupted. I've never We're... interrupted anybody during this programme and I'm being systematically interrupted. I'm terribly sorry. We, we are going to let you have the last word, though, John Laughland. I hope that makes up for it to some extent. All right, thank you very much indeed, Douglas Herbert, uh, Nina Zakarina Berezna, uh, and in New York tonight, Rachel Denver. Thanks to you for watching. That's it for tonight's debate.